Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of season number two of Hit It Where They Mow, Talking Golf in Texas. It's a golf podcast with a definitive or decidedly Texas slant. I'm your host, Pat Wheeler, and today we're going to talk about remembering Lord Byron. That's Byron Nelson, the namesake of the AT&T Byron Nelson being played for, I believe, the, either the 55th or 56th time. Uh, it started as the Byron Nelson Classic in 1968 at Preston Trail Golf Club, and this year it's being played at Craig Ranch Golf Club in McKinney. And I am excited and honored to welcome in someone who knew Lord Byron pretty well, wrote about him, uh, wrote with him, uh, interviewed him on a couple occasions, I know, if not more, Mr. Russ Pate. Russ Welcome to Hit It Where They Mow. Thank you, Pat. It's great to be here, and congratulations on your second season of Hit It Where They Mow. Well, I appreciate that. It is a lot of fun to talk golf, and uh, our audiences are, quote, golf geeks, people that love to talk about golf. And I had the opportunity to meet Byron Nelson on one occasion. It was, I'm going to guess, the late 90s. It was at the uh, TPC Four Seasons. And um, he came out on one of the golf holes that I was watching. I think it was near the tee box on one of the holes. And I walked over and introduced myself. And I said, congratulations, Mr. Nelson, on a wonderful field. That year, I think they had the top 49 of the World 50 golf rankings. And, you know, today they would call that an elevated event. Indeed. And uh, it just shows you the respect that people have had for him. And, of course, no knock on Tiger Woods, but he's really not played in Texas ever since Byron passed away. Maybe won tour championship at Champions, but that was the kind of impact he had on, on the game of golf. But tell me a little bit about your relationship with Byron Nelson to kind of get us rolling. Well, one quick story, Pat. I met Byron Nelson in the uh, summer of 1968 when the PGA Championship was being competed at Pecan Valley in San Antonio. I was uh, attending college at Texas Tech uh, University in Lubbock, but uh, squeezed in a couple of summer courses at UT campus in Austin. And I was near San Antonio, and I looked down, and uh, my hero, Arnold Palmer, was near the lead. And so uh, my brother and I ventured down from Austin to San Antonio that day, and our fan belt broke in San Marcos, so we lost a couple of hours. So we weren't there when Arnie teed off. We had to play catch-up on the back nine. But when we got to the course at the 18th Tower, standing below it, dressed to the nines in a suit, immaculately dressed, and quad was Mr. Byron Nelson, and we weren't going to pass up walking by a golf legend, so we went up, introduced ourselves, and proceeded to talk to him for 10 or 15 minutes. It was just incredible, but he was so friendly, down to earth, made you feel right at home, and was happy to answer our questions, most of which were about Arnold Palmer and his chances of winning that day. So I'll never forget that, uh, and I'll ne ne also I will never forget that Arnold Palmer missed the birdie putt on the 72nd hole that would have tied for the lead. And Julius Boris, at 48 years old, got up and down from 30 yards to beat Palmer by one. So we were steamed the whole way back to Austin. Smoke was coming out of our ears and out of the radiator. So it was a memorable day to meet Byron Nelson. You know, I, I'm, I know I'm going to love this show because you're a writer and a former radio host yourself. And, and the first thing I'm envisioning is... Okay, it's either August or late July, probably August, and your fan belt or your radio. What was it, fan belt? Yes, the fan belt. But yes. anyway, I'm sure it was very warm uh, on that drive down. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt about it. Yes, it was. And you know, I just want to mention Julius Boris had no business winning that PGA championship. The man was 48 years old. And of course, that made him the oldest winner of a major in golf history. The previous holder of that title was old Tom Morris who won in 1867. That's how long it's 101 years he'd been the oldest major winner. So what was Julius Boris winning at 48 years old? And as you know, Pat, that record has stood up since 1968 until Phil Mickelson came along to Kiowa Island at age 50 and won a major. I can already tell I've met my match today. 
bringing up old Tom as the previous oldest, I, I, I wouldn't have gotten that. You would have stumped me. I would have failed that one. That's And uh, yes, Phil, uh, that was amazing when he won at Kiowa Island there uh, to eclipse Julius Boris. And uh, we just had the the uh, passing of Don January this week at age 93, and Julius Boris was one of those ones that Don held in high esteem. He said the more pressure there was, the better he got. And, um, yeah, he won, as you know, the U.S. Open at Northwood Club in 1952. Uh, then he won – Famously at Brookline in 1963. Was your friend Jackie Cupid part of that playoff? He sure was. And Jackie Cupid double bogeyed the 71st hole at the country club in Brookline, Massachusetts, much like Harry Varden had done 50 years prior to that in 1913. So we're getting real deep into history right now, but history is what I love. And so with that, let's. Talk And I love what you said about Byron Nelson being well quaffed, because I will tell a quick story about that. Uh, when Mr. A.J. Triggs went into the Texas Golf Hall of Fame, and by the way, he was friends and uh, for, uh, from North Texas as well as Don January, and they died on the same date, eight years apart. A.J. was 85. May 7th of 2015, and Don was uh, 93, May 7th of uh, 2023. But when he was going in the Hall of Fame, he said, we all had our idols, and mine was Byron Nelson. And he said, I was working in the golf shop at the golf course there in Denton. They called it the trap. Dennis Walters was on my show, and I said, why did they call it the trap? He said, I think because it had one sand trap on it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he said uh, it was a cold December afternoon, kind of drizzling, sleeting. He was down in the basement there, and there was a rap on the uh, door, and he answered the door. This is when A.J. was in college, so we're talking about early 50s and our late 40s, probably early 50s. And he said, standing before him with a snap brim cap, I don't know what kind of shirt he had. I've forgotten that part. Cashmere sweater. uh, Oh, leather jacket. Cashmere sweater, tweed slacks, and as AJ said, the best looking pair of foot joys I've ever seen in my life was Lord Byron himself. Oh, wow. And he said, Do you mind if I hit some shag balls out here? And AJ said, No, Mr. Nelson, and if you'll give me about two minutes, I'll shag for you. So, what a great story that was. But when you met him in 68, he was doing his commentating with ABC and Chris Schinkel. That's right. He and Chris Schenkel were working as a team, and uh, I a few years, so oh, probably uh, twenty years later, I had the opportunity to write a bowling story. Try to be versatile in the writing game, and uh, I was uh, assigned a story to write about uh, Chris Schenkel and his broadcast partner Nelson Bo Burton. And in the course of that conversation uh, with Chris Schenkel, I mentioned to him how uh, warm and gracious Byron was, and recounted to him my uh, visit at the '68 PGA. And Chris said, "Well, absolutely, he was the nicest man I ever knew." So had a good talk, and of course, Chris might have been the runner-up for that. He himself was a terrific guy. Yeah, you know, earlier I mentioned uh, Dan Reeves being on the, on the show with Don January. You said who had the who had the biggest drawl, Southern drawl. Byron had a distinctive voice, kind of nasally, maybe I don't know, but it wasn't really a drawl. It wasn't say. a drawl, but it was high pitched. High pitched, okay. and he was famous in those telecasts. For um, Chris would uh, Chris would throw it over to Byron and say, "What does it look like, Byron?" And he would say, "Chris, it's a speed putt." <laughs> He must have said, Chris, it's a speed putt a hundred times. By the time I was a teenager, my brother and I would go around the golf course saying, Chris, it's a speed putt. (laughs) So So we did get to meet him for that. And as we know, every putt is a speed putt, basically. Well, this is true, but he'd say it. And, you know, I also love Bob Rosberg, who always said, you know, he's got no shot. No shot, Bob Rosberg. He has another great signature line. We're going to meander a little bit. That's okay, as long as we come back. But... I'll never forget watching the PGA from Shoal Creek in 1990, I guess it was, and Payne Stewart was in contention. I knew Payne, loved the guy, and uh, he hit a shot way off the map. And you hear this, you don't, you hear this voice call out, "That's right, Rossi, I got no shot." <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, so it was it was good, but uh, but. Um, 
you can't talk about Byron Nelson. Well, let's go back to 68, and then let's set the stage that way. That was the year that the Dallas Open, which it really kind of hit or miss. Um, you know, Byron won it in 1944 at Lakewood Country Club. That was during the war. It was called the, the Texas Victory Open. Uh, ben Hogan won it. Sam Snead won it. Then it went away for about 10 years. And came back in 1956. Don January won one of two Dallas Opens that year. The other one, Peter Thompson, the great Australian one. Um, then it went to Oak Cliff Country Club. From Well, it went to Glen Lakes for one year. Sam Snead won it there with a 60 the third round. And he thought he shot 59, but he misadded. Hope he signed for the right score. Well, yeah, I think he did. <laughs> they gave him the check. But okay. then he won it the next year at uh oak cliff the first year it was there and then it went for 10 years there and people like billy maxwell charles cootie roberto davincenzo earl stewart jr johnny pot and finally bert yancey won the 1967 dallas open and i thought why is there only eight pictures up if it was there 10 years well they skipped two years 1963 1965 Free plug for them now. It's the Golf Club of Dallas. Very good condition. Just played it. They've spiffed up the clubhouse. Great pictures of those former champions. Charles Cootie's got a crew cut. He's quite young at the time. <laughs> but then in 68, the Salesmanship Club, which before that time had basically done some – it was involved with the 63 PGA at DAC, won by Jack Nicklaus when he held the trophy with a towel. <laughs> Um, and won the long drive contest, and he still carries the money clip for that. That's so cool. Um, they had done the preseason game for the Cowboys. I know my dad and older brother went to see the Packers um, and the Cowboys in 1964 at the Cotton Bowl, but they got involved, and they named it the Byron Nelson Classic, and – would you call it a stroke of genius? Perhaps they've raised over $100 million for charity, for their charity. They used to have a boys and girls camp down in Hawkins, Texas. Now they have the Momentous Institute over in Oak Cliff. But take take it from right there. You know, the Byron Nelson, first tournament ever named after a golfer, Preston Trail, it was a real hit. It was a huge hit. And uh, if I can back up just a quick second, okay. the same year – well, Don January and a few others uh, disengaged the PGA Tour from the PGA of America. So you're, and I also wanted to make one other quick comment about John January, yeah. which was, and I'm sure you got to see the legends down at Onion Creek. Yes, but you know Don's play with Gene Littler as a partner, and I think he won one year with Sam Snead. I could be wrong about that, but they really put that tour on the map. Twenty, they, him and Snead were twenty seven under for fifty four holes. So they birdied every other hole. Well, that was I. We saw him that year. I happened to be in attendance yeah. the one year I went to that particular tournament. And Onion Creek was a great venue, but you could yeah. see the the possibility, the potential yes. of the senior tour. And Don was its first star. Yes, you know. Yes, the ratings bumped when Arnold Palmer turned uh, fifty and came out on the tour. But he, uh, you know, was still playing the other tours a, a good bit. And Don was the you know the king, the first guy there. And of course later Lee Trevino, another great Dallas yeah. site, and Mike yes. Hill dominated that yes. tournament for years. So that was a great one. But the big move to Preston Trail, we had, you know, there was a great aura around Preston Trail. Sure People had heard about that, and uh, of course Mickey Mantle and others famously put that club on the map in north dallas so that was an exciting uh, and big move but you're right about the salesmanship club in fact that as you know they're far and away the leader in total monies raised for charity and just done a fabulous job and i you know we can see those guys in the red pants in our dreams see if i can stump you i know i won't oh sure but, you will but who won that first byron nelson in 68 at preston trail well i don't know uh ah. i will guess uh, no it wasn't arnold palmer uh, i don't know Jack Nicholas. Mr. X. Mr. Miller Barber. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Another great Texan. Another Texar cannon. Yes. Which yes. side of the border did he live on? I was never clear about well, that. Well, he might have grown up in Arkansas because he went to the University of Arkansas, but he ended up living in Sherman. He owned the course up there, uh, okay. Woodlawn, okay. with uh, Reed Omohundro, whose son, Sale, and I are good friends. Uh, we're the, oh, right. the same, Sale, same yeah. age. Sure. Um, but so, yeah, the, and, and, and another thing about Byron, I love 
just again, we're meandering, but this is fun. I love this. Uh, he helped design that golf course. Him and Ralph Plummer designed Preston Trail. They called in Byron to assist Ralph Plummer, who, of course, is a Hall of Fame designer, did so many great courses, uh, champions, Cypress Creek course at champions. Uh, and, of course, my not my home course, not the one I grew up on, but the one I now – uh, have a non-resident membership at Willowbrook Country Club in Tyler was a Ralph Plummer design. Um, and I wanted to mention one other thing while we're talking about designs. He did the first, Byron did the first nine holes at the Grapevine Municipal. Oh, really? Okay. And they have the dam hole. It's either D-A-M or D-A-M, D-A-M-N, depending on how you, how you play it. The one par five that runs all the way along the, the Lake Grapevine Dam there. And they had a huge pecan tree up by the green, and Byron insisted that that pecan tree be left there. And he's old school, kind of like Ralph Plummer. They believe that a tree could be a hazard, you right. know, less expensive than digging a trap or digging a lake. And Steve Walford and D.A. Wyburn redid it, and he said, uh, Steve Walford told me it was so funny. No one dare get close to that tree with a tractor. They didn't, they didn't want to be the one that knocked down Byron's uh, pecan tree. But um, he was just, you know, he was just so involved in all facets of golf. And we're not even getting into his record yet, which we will. Right. Well, I didn't get it out to. I know you attended some of the early uh, events at Preston Trail, but mm -hmm. I didn't make it out there. I think it was '81. And uh, that was the first time I went to the, attend the tournament. And uh, Tom Watson had won three in a row. And, of course, the relationship I'm sure you'll touch on with Byron Nelson and Tom Watson was yes. the stuff of legend. But he'd already won three consecutive Nelsons and was gunning for a fourth. And uh, had a little slip up at the end. And your old pal Bruce Litsky won in a playoff to, to keep the four-peat from happening. So there was a chance uh, that Tom could have joined a very small list of people who've won four consecutive PGA Tour events at the same venue. Absolutely. And I don't have my notes in front of me. That might have been the last year they had it at Preston Trail, or the following year might have been the last year, because I think Ben Crenshaw won the first year they had it at it, uh, what they call then the Sports Club. The Sports Club. At Las Colinas, now the TPC Four Seasons. But Bruce Litsky liked to say that Here's a trivia question for you. Um, when's the only time someone won a PGA Tour event, not a major, but a PGA Tour event with an over par score? And it was that 1981 Byron Nelson. He shot 281, one over par, par 70. I said, how did that happen? He said it was windy all four days. And wind is one thing that can. That's one of the yeah. big defenses. Yes. Yes. And so, and we see it at the open typically, um, and some other venues. But yes, it, well, you know how the wind is here in Texas. So, well, good for him. And of course, uh, he grew up in Port Arthur, Beaumont, Beaumont, very close. The Triangle. I knew he was down yes. there somewhere and played yes. at Houston, but he could handle the wind. Yeah, great player, great guy. We we lost him too early. He had uh, uh, cancer and died, uh, I believe, in 2017. I went to the funeral. Tom Watson was there. It was packed at the first baptist church there in athens texas bruce was very gracious toward me uh and granting me interviews and time on the radio and so forth but you make a good point about tom watson and, and a lot of people may not remember this about tom watson but early on he was definitely a budding superstar but he had a little choking problem he threw away a couple i know one u.s open he had the lead and shot 79 and maybe a PGA had the lead, and he shot a 75 or something. And he went to Lord Byron for a little help. And it wasn't so much a swing, but just how to close out a tournament. And what better person to go to than somebody that won 11 in a row, which we will get into. But that 11 in a row is kind of like DiMaggio's 57-game hitting streak or Wilt Chamberlain's 100 points in a game. Probably won't see that one broken, 11 tournaments in a row. But before we talk about that, which I know you interviewed him on that specifically, his relationship with Tom Watson, I know you've, you, you've talked to Byron or you've, you know about that. 
I did. He, you know, they kind of had a father-son relationship. Uh, Byron told me he per- was particularly attracted to Tom's seriousness and his demeanor. You know, I don't, and I, you make a great point. I don't think he changed Tom's swing appreciably. Uh, Tom said that uh, he learned how to breathe. I think Byron helped him how to breathe. He started winning golf tournaments his, when he could control his breath. I uh, worked on a project with Holden Productions, who've produced a lot of uh, golf videos through the years, and we did one on all the Ryder Cup captains, and uh, I was interviewing Tom for that, and he was talking about, you know, I'd ask him about his relationship with Byron. He said, well, you know, you have to really control your breath in clutch moments, so when I learn to control my breath. So, you know, it's not always something technical and not a glitch, so it's some, perhaps something physical like that, or mental, or both. You know, I love Johnny Miller. I miss his commentary. And he said a lot of the choking is mental. You just get you, your mind gets to going too fast. Right. Yeah. And uh, and so maybe the breathing is a, is a way to to uh, control but, it. But, you know, but Byron and Tom hit a, ball, a lot of balls and, you know, watched him and had that, you know, sort of relationship where they trusted each other. And the results speak for themselves. Absolutely. He did work with Marty Fleckman. The but we love Marty. He's down in Houston and teaches. And Marty didn't have the success of Tom Watson, but Marty is in a rare company of Ben Crenshaw. And I, that may be just the two of them that they won their very first tour start. Oh, where was Marty's? Marty's was the Cajun Classic. Oh, boy. There you and go. Ben's was the Texas Open in San Antonio. Right. Okay. It wasn't at Oak Hills or Breckenridge Park, it was at another venue, which I can't recall right offhand and speaking of not re- controlling your breathing and, and and maybe choking a little bit i forgot to mention my great sponsors of this podcast and their caps are in front of us here and i have two corporate sponsors and two golf courses that sponsor us and i would like to just say a word about them before we get back into talking about lord byron and that is a uh, niagara conservation which is a uh, plumbing company uh, based uh, here in the DFW area. They're a big supporter of the LPGA and the Volunteers of America tournament that they have annually out at the Colony. And I like to say avoid the water hazards on the course and avoid them uh, at home. Get a low-flow toilet. It's hard to say that. Um, you can get them at, you know, like Home Depot, and that kind of place. But they're a Niagara product. So I want to thank the fine folks at Niagara who are committed to charity and to golf. And Veritex Bank is the golf bank of Texas. Excellent. And they're one of our great sponsors. And they are especially good for personal banking and small commercial banking, f- small commercial loans. Veritex Bank, the uh, uh Golf Bank of Texas. And my two golf courses, one is just north of here, Dornick Hills. In Ardmore? Yeah. Oh, famous, famous. The home of the great Perry Maxwell. It was his farm. And uh, he, along with Alistair McKenzie, who designed Augusta National, some of the great architects of golf. Um, And you can get a very affordable non-resident membership there and you can drive 90 minutes from anywhere in dallas and be on the first that's what i was going to ask you how long what's the drive time can 90 you minutes up there 90 minutes all right Excellent. if you live up in lewisville maybe 75 minutes you know but but anyway basically 90 minutes and then near and dear to my heart being an east texas guy from tyler is the tempest golf club right off interstate 20 just west of longview and it's east texas golf as it was meant to be so you can google dorna kills you can go to tempestgolfclub.com are there piney woods over there at the tempest giant pines all right giant pines big hills go water right. All the things we love about East Texas. Oh, that's pretty land over there. For it sure. really is. So thank you, sponsors. And, and we're right in the middle of this thing. And I've got a compadre here who's forgotten more about golf than <laughs> I know. So I'm loving this. But tell me about your project with Byron recounting the year 1945 when he won 18 tournaments overall, but 11 in a row. Just crazy. It's just crazy good. Just crazy good, record-setting, and as you pointed out, as um, untouchable a record as there is in sport, right up there with DiMaggio and Wilt the Stilt. So, well, as um, as the 50th anniversary 
of that great remarkable achievement neared uh, some of Byron's advisors and uh, people and uh, his wife Peggy and his uh, accountant and business manager John Bradley etc were looking at ways to capitalize on the occasion and uh, the offer came along for Byron to um, recast his thoughts and memory. One thing about Byron is, of course, as a few others, he had a tremendous recall. Mm. He remembered those shots. He remembered those feelings. He had, uh, you know, he had a brain like a what? Are, what are those people called? Well, I don't know, like an accountant, I suppose. He could account for just about everything that had happened. So. And I had collaborated with him on a couple of projects, including an instruction manual for the Byron Nelson Golf School at the Four Seasons Resort a couple of years earlier. And I'd interviewed him here and there. And in those days, Pat, I was uh, annually sort of commissioned to write the top two or three stories in the tournament program. Mm. So I had a lot of exposure out there at the... And I was called in. I guess I was hosting a radio show on golf on KLIF in those days as yeah. well. Anyway, somehow we got together. I seemed to be a natural fit, and they asked me. And so a production company came in from Chicago, as I recall, and we sat down in a room with a you know, snack bar and a mini bar and some recorder, you know, microphones like this. And he just, we just hammered out his memories of 11 straight tournaments. And, of course, the very first one was in Miami, and it was a four-ball tournament. And Jug McSpaden, his great buddy, was his partner for that. And they were so successful as a team, they were known as the Gold Dust Twins. <laughs> and then they were off and running. And uh, it was just a remarkable two days of recording. We took a few breaks, you know, and um, got it down on tape, and now... With your help and others, we might get it digitized someday and bring it back to life and spin it out there. I hope so. One of the things I want to do today, too, is, is let people know that, that you have – I don't know how many books are still in print, but you've been prolific. I I, I, I want to congratulate you on that. I only have two books. And, and I'm looking forward to reading your most recent one, Pat. Yeah, so. The Fringe Runner. I'm definitely a fringe character, so it was, it was, a, it was a natural. Um, I, I, I just uh, – uh, is there anything in that interview that sticks out to you about what he had to say? Any anything? I know within that those wins were like the Western Open or the Canadian Open. He he won everywhere he went. Obviously, right? Anything that sticks out? Well, I, I guess the main thing that I remember, or the thing I remember most, is um, you know, Pat, what what the feeling must be like when you wake up in the morning knowing you're going to shoot 66. Mm. You know, that must be a rare to stay in the zone that long. Mm -hmm. I asked him how he prepared for that. He said, I never thought about my swing. I just thought about the shots I had to play. Mm. And he said, in fact, and you may or may, may not believe this, Russ, but I would dream about my round the next day. And it was like when I woke up, I knew what I was going to do. And then I just acted out the dream I had had. Wow. So. That was, that was his great confession. I said, that wow, what a no world working. that must be. Because all I dream about is shanking it on the first tee, Byron. I never get beyond the shot one, and I hope I don't well, kill anybody. Well, you, you're you better than me. Mine's definitely performance anxiety because I can never tee it up in the right spot. So people will finish their round. They'll go to the 19th hole, play gin rummy, and I'm still out there trying to <laughs> – Somebody told me one time they had the same dream. They couldn't get their shoulder pads on in the locker room. So, uh, anyway, but um, – I don't think he was anxious about that. The, the thing about the zone, I did pick up this book, uh, which I bought. Um, it's the uh, Byron Nelson, the, the little black book, where he uh, offers really just tidbits of wisdom about how to manage your game. And what you're saying about – him not thinking about his swing, thinking about where he wants the ball to go, is recently publicized as really the strength of Scotty Scheffler's game. Yeah, he's got a good swing. He's got I mean, you, you can't play without that, but but without a good functional swing. It may not be pretty, but it, it has to function. But he calls it being present for every shot. In other words, whenever I start to play well, I begin to think of, oh, I'm gonna shoot this or that, and then I it's catastrophe, and you don't do that, you know, and good golfers don't do that. They just think about the shot they have. Some of that may creep in, but they know how to trick their mind back to the task at hand. But he talks about the end of the streak in Memphis 
to a fellow named Freddie Haas beat him by two strokes. Uh, do you recall what he had to say about that? No, but I do recall that Freddie Haas was an amateur. Yes. And Freddie Haas had attended the college at LSU. Yes. And Freddie Haas dated my aunt, Catherine Pate Callahan, who was Catherine Pate in those days. So at a young age, I knew about Freddie Haas. I didn't know. I didn't know he ended Byron's winning streak. Oh, but, he did. Yeah. But that came later. Yeah. But I had been talking with my aunt about LSU. My father also attended LSU, so we had the LSU file working, and they were telling me about a great golfer named Freddie Haas. And then years later, Byron says, "Oh, and then I lost to Freddie Haas." Said, oh, wait a minute. You, certainly not. And he also lost to George Lowe Jr., the legendary George Lowe Jr., who was a putting guru. And a player himself who became known as America's guest. Dan Jenkins called him America's guest because I've been there's, accused of that. There's no there's no record of George ever paying for anything anywhere after about the age thirty. Well, again, we're meandering and that's okay. Uh the first time I ever went to Augusta, uh I had been in Atlanta about two weeks. And on Monday of the of the of the Masters, uh, I had the week before, I'd asked my boss, can I take off Monday? He goes, well, you just got there. I said, well, I'm going to drive over with a friend and, and see Augusta National Practice Round, 1988. At that time, you could buy a ticket at the gate for five bucks and go in. And my friend Mike Fleming came over from Tyler, and we drove over, and we got in. And then they have the big oak tree up there, um, kind of on the corner of the clubhouse there where the pro shop was, which is – a beautiful place for holding court. And there was a guy in a sport coat flicking ashes all over himself with giant ears holding court. Later, I figured it out. It was George Lowe. It was. I wrote about him. I didn't know it was George Lowe at the time, but I wrote about the the sage old country club guy in the sport coat holding court. He said that Greg Norman is losing tournaments by putting too much backspin on his ball. He needs to learn how to take some of the backspin off. That's high level stuff, as you know. So uh, anyway, we, I, we digress. But uh, well, George Lowe would also sit on the patio right outside the pro shop at the Las Colinas Sports Club when the Nelson was going I on. So that. he was there, and you'd find him at Colonial mm-hmm. when Colonial was there. He was there. I mean, he was on tour. He was America's guest. There he was. But let's give him credit for the putter, the flange putter, much like the eighty-eight hundred two, uh, which which Jack Nicklaus used. I think the George Lowe putter to win. I believe he did. A lot of his majors, right? right. Yeah. So, so I'm glad we got to George Lowe. He doesn't now, get into too I'm going to throw you another Uh-oh. question here. And you're, you're, I, I invite you to stump me, which I know you can probably do very easily. <laughs> but uh, next week, just to plug folks for next week's show, uh, Scott Verplank, uh, a, a young man that grew up in Dallas, was won the state amateur twice, was a star at Oklahoma State, national championship teams up there. Won the Western Open as an amateur in 1945. Oh, excuse me, 1985. 85. Right? Haas was an amateur that won in 1944, not 1945. I don't know the year, but Phil Mickelson won at Tucson or Phoenix. He won one of the Arizona tournaments while he was still at Arizona State. Probably was 91. But. So there's two more guys that have won as amateurs, and oh, I would never have gotten it, but I didn't know if you wanted to hazard a guess. No, I don't. Uh, okay. But uh, has it been since, Phil? I don't think no, so. No, it was, it was it in was the 50s. Long ago and far yeah. away. Yeah. All right. So did, One of them was did Frank gr- Stranahan win a tournament? No, he didn't. One of them was a great dresser. A great dresser who was an amateur. flamboyant dresser okay well that, short backswing now, doug sanders yes. won the canadian open yes. as an amateur i yes. collaborated with him on the book action on the first tee really well we can yes. go down that trail a little bit <laughs> we but go. the other one was oh. gene littler san diego open around 58 or 9 gene the machine yes don january's partner yes and of yes. course the, oh don love lit as he called him. Lit. Well, Lit yeah. was, you know, Gene the Machine. What a, what a beautiful swing to emulate. Well, exactly. Yeah. His swing and Byron, Iron, Byron. Yeah. You know, these guys with the great swings. And, of course, Don January and Julius Boris had that tempo. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one reason they stayed so good so long, I think. They just had flawless and tempo. Julius Boris told Roy Pace, he, he said, he got to drive him to the airport once, how can I play better? And he goes, go to the movies. In other words, visualize your shot. Don't just hit it. And uh, 
easier said than done, but a lot of those guys do that. So. so you're having Scott Verplank, a winner of the Byron Nelson Classic. Now you were were you an, out there that year? An emotional win. No, I I in '88 I moved to Atlanta for about 20 years, so I missed oh, yeah. a lot of Texas oh, history. But I'm okay. I'm a Texan, right? I'm right. Back from uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. We're glad to have you back. It was a very emotional win for him. Of course, he's a Dallas kid and had played in the tournament. Come close. Mm-hmm. Even lost in a playoff previously to Robert Damron, as I, I recall. Didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay. So he had a okay. you know the whole town was pulling for him. I don't recall uh, Justin Leonard winning the. Nelson, that doesn't Payne ring Stewart bit. won it after giving it away to yes. Bob Eastwood. Oh, right, yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, so P- Payne was kind of a Dallas guy, even though he's from uh, Missouri, Springfield, Missouri. And then he lived in Orlando when he was a pro, but he had planned to move back here when he was tragically killed. That so. was tragic, of course. Yeah. Well, I had got an assignment uh, years and years ago from Gentleman's Quarterly magazine to do because, as you know, Payne was the uh, fashion forward yeah. guy on tour. The modern Doug Sanders. The yeah. modern Doug Sanders. So they wanted an article. And so I, you know, I would time a lot of these articles to uh, Nelson Week and spend Monday and Tuesday visiting with some of the players in the clubhouse. So I spent some time on the practice tee and in between shots uh, while Payne was hitting, swinging with one hand and talking to me as he'd turn his head. And- Etc. He was telling me that he got his sartorial advice from his father, Bill, yes, yes. who said, you know, make an impression, son, wherever you go. And so he said, my dad. Furniture salesman, I think. Some kind of salesman. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, but he said, you know, make an impression. So my, he said, my dad always wore the real loud sport coats and, you know, looked like uh, Rodney Dangerfield and Caddyshack or something. But anyway, made an impression that stuck in Payne's mind. So and I remember, you know, how. It's splendid he looked in Carolina blue with white socks and white shoes. He could pull it off. Uh, whatever he had on, it was a, yeah. you know it was a great look, and not everybody could do that. You know, in a way, he's kind of like Elvis. We'll always remember him as young. You know, he he was the same age as Elvis. They were both forty two. Were they both forty two? Wow. Yeah. 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 Well, I. Uh, I learned a lot interviewing those guys on the practice tee at the Four Seasons Club while they would warm up for their Nelson rounds. And, uh, you know, you quickly appreciate that the worst player out there is better than anyone you know personally. Mm -hmm. Your club champion would have no chance against the worst guy Mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing how talented those guys are. And that year after I talked to Payne, he teed off and I followed him for a few holes. And I remember him making an up and down where, you know, he had a straight downhill shot. And you thought he'll be lucky not to hit it in the water on the other side. And And somehow from that he could spin the ball and it stopped short. I would have lost any bet of any amount of money that no human being could stop the ball. He had no green to work with. But somehow they impart the spin. It didn't slow him down a bit. You know, he kind of shrugged at me. Okay. No big deal. (laughs) Yeah. uh, By the way, Tim January, uh, Don's son, uh, he's now working out at the, uh, the new PGA course in Frisco. But he, for a good while, he's worked at Royal Oaks Country Club in Dallas. And, of course, Don January and Billy Martindale started that club in the late 60s and built it. But he said that he recently, he's gotten to be good friends with Scotty Scheffler, and, and uh, they kind of needle each other back and forth. But uh, uh, he told Scott, he, Scotty, he said, you have that one thing that is indispensable for a great player. And Scotty said, what's that? He says, a boatload of talent. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were talking about pain, I thought that he just had that talent that you can't coach it. I mean, you either have it or you don't. And we were talking earlier about theories I have that have been debunked. Well, one of them that was debunked, and probably rightfully so, is here's – and you're a sports writer guy. We're, we're probably some of the smartest guys in the world, sports writers. I've or heard that often. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, my, I heard this, and I concurred with it, and I've used it a lot until it was debunked by uh, Ken Green. Um, if you had uh, Rafael Nadal play your country club tennis champion 100 times, Nadal would win 100 times. And it, it would be love and love 95 of those times. <laughs> right. But if you had Scotty Scheffler play your club champion – a hundred times, your club champion is going to beat him a few times. He's going to have a really bad day, and your club champion is going to have a really good day. 
Ken Green didn't go along with that. He said maybe that might happen, but to me, that's the the luck element in golf that is not in tennis. Well, uh, the marker, I forget who it was a couple of years ago at Augusta at the Masters, they needed a marker because somebody had withdrawn with an injury. And the marker out, you know, marker shot 71 that day and the pro shot 75. I forget who it was. And I don't want to embarrass the pro by but naming names. That name. guy's name is Knox. That he, he has a course record at Augusta. Yeah, he's he, a good amateur, but he's. Yeah, but he, you know, he, he had a skin on so the wall that day. Me, huh? yeah, 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 I do. Okay. I'm, I'm a, anytime yeah. you need concurrence and not debunking, give me a call. You have my number. So, uh, and ask Scott Verplank. You know, I wrote uh, the very first big profile of him. I I forget if it was in Golf Illustrated or maybe it was in Texas Sports World. But after he won the uh, U.S. Amateur. Yeah, and before he, or I guess maybe he'd won the Western Amateur as well. But anyway, I did a profile on him, so I followed, known him a long time. His uh, parents, Bob and Betty, were mm-hmm. real nice folks, and of course Harless Wade, the great Harless Wade, yeah. had launched his career. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I kind of wrote a couple articles about him. So the year at Shoal Creek in Birmingham, it seems to me. You may or may not want to ask him about this, but as I recall, he birdied the first three holes of the tournament, and I said it's going to be a great week. And then he. Drove it out of bounds on the fourth hole, made triple, and was back to even par and wasn't ever heard oh, from really? again. Yeah. I'm just kidding. You're not going to ask him about that. No, but, I probably won't. But anyway, he did have some great moments, none bigger than winning the Nelson here and sort of uh, tearing up, welling up, collapsing, hugging. Yeah, and Peggy was there. Peggy yeah, was there. It was uh, a great moment. I think Byron had died the year before maybe, or maybe two years before. It was close. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he, he looked up. When he right. when he uh, when he won and uh, um, and, and let's let's go down that trail a little bit. You know, Byron's known as a, a gentleman and a man of faith, and I know you are as well as I am. We're we're believers, and right. uh, uh, he was just so good for the game in that aspect. I think. Well, yeah, he's the sort of the walking definition of integrity, a real integrated soul, a person with, with great faith. Uh, great, I, I say he had great faith and great family values mm-hmm. and uh, great focus about what he was doing, getting back to that dreaming and that focus and that tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I asked him uh, once we were doing this project, and I asked him several times on several interviews, you know, the answer was always the same. I asked Byron, you were 34 years old. Yes. You're at the peak of your powers. Yes. You've won 18, count them, 18 tournaments, 11 of them consecutively. Why did you walk away from it? He said, my entire goal was to make enough money to buy a ranch for me and Louise so we could settle down and have some cattle and a nice life. In which, of course, he did. But, you know, it's amazing. I think I mentioned to you I consider him the Jim Brown of golf. I wonder where you were going with that. Jim Brown, the, arguably the greatest running back in NFL history, played nine years in the NFL and won eight rushing titles. Holy cow. I didn't can you, that. Can you believe that? You, 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 and at age 30, said, I think I'll go make some movies and went to film The Dirty Dozen, which was a big cult favorite right. in the 1960s with a great scene that directors wisely put in of him running through a minefield for, right. to satisfy all the football fans out there, but walking away at the top of the sport. Now, Byron Nelson coming off. His remarkable year in 45, hung around for a few events, won a few more tournaments in 46, and then walked away at the age of 34. And it just sort of said, here, Ben and Sam, take over. It's all yours. Hmm. So what could have been? He could have stayed out there had he wanted to, had he not been totally driven on Getting the wherewithal to buy the ranch and settling down with his beloved Louise, that was his focus. That's what he did. A very contented man, very thankful man, a man very much at peace, who was at very much at peace all his life, I do believe. I think so. Um, that's very rare to walk away like that. Um, by the way, Louise was from Texarkana. They met at the Church of Christ there. Um he was pro there at Texarkana for a short period of time. They have a plaque that's in my new book, The Fringe Runner, and you can get The Fringe Runner on Amazon.com, or you can email me, um, and if, if you don't know what that is, then just Google Google me or whatever. But anyway, the plaque is on the 16th hole. He, he holed a three-wood for a two on a par five. The only time he ever did it, 
supposedly. You know, Sarazen famously did it at the 15th hole at Augusta National. Um, and there's a plaque, and everybody says it's good luck to go over there and tap that plaque when you play that hole. And so, uh, so did you do that, Pat? I certainly did. And then you made a four or a three? Well, no, but somebody in my group made a four, so it worked for him and not for me. But uh, I was having other struggles that day. But I love that golf course. I call it the best course in Texas that's not in Texas. It's one mile into Arkansas. How they let that happen, I'll never know. But uh, oh, well, it's a great, great golf I've course. I've never played that course, but I hear wonderful things and always have about it. Uh, My late friend Craig Bivens called it Tex Augusta because it looks like Augusta. Clubhouse looks like Augusta. And um, – and you can play it if you know somebody that's a member there. So, uh, yeah. And that's Augusta. where Byron would practice ahead of the Masters, right? Right. Because right. he saw the similarities and right. wanted to some of the same shot shapes, right. et cetera. So that was good. Now, just a little bit more about Byron. He was of that era when steel shafts came in. And he had the famous caddy dip. Right, yes. But he had great leg action, which they said that, you know, with a with a – a uh, hickory shaft might cause problems because it was so flexible that you would get out of line or whatever. But with steel, you could use more of your body. So he was really the first modern golf swing. That's right. Did he ever talk about that with you? Not Well, I'm sure he did, and, yeah. uh, and I hope it's on the tape. But yes. Of course, it went over my head, and unfortunately, I could put none of it into practice. So uh, it, he was wasting his breath, but I'm sure it, we probably touched on that at some point or another. Well, uh, he was pretty tall, wasn't he? Byron was a good 6'2". Okay. What are you, about 6'3"? Uh, you and Pooh Welch. In that neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Me and Pooh Welch. I love the fact I have to tell Pooh he got on the podcast. He'll love that. Yeah. Uh, one of the great basketball players uh, that I've ever watched play. and One of the great guys. Who, so I, and by the way, has one of the greatest man sheds I've ever seen as far as sports memorabilia. So he's got... Does he have any golf memorabilia in there? No, I did buy him a... Uh, a, um, I think it was Andy. No, I bought him a Glenn Campbell L.A. Open golf cap because he has a lot of music memorabilia. Oh, okay. So nice. that fit in real nicely into the man shed there. So I noticed you were looking at your notes. I haven't looked at mine. Uh, well, that's because you've got you've got it all packed well, in there real good. But I'm I wanted to point out something to you in okay. case none of our audience realized how good a player Byron Nelson was. Yes, do that. So let me point out that in the year two thousand. Golf Digest had a poll of the greatest golfers of all time. So here was the list from Golf Digest in the year 2000. Number one was Jack Nicklaus. Number two was Ben Hogan. Number three was Sam Snead. Number four was Bobby Jones. And number five was Byron Nelson. And now, which of the, one of those guys? Well, Bobby Jones retired. Or he was well, an amateur. Tiger. This was, well, this was in the year 2000. So Tiger just getting started. Yeah. Tiger okay. was just getting started. Okay. Now, Sports Illustrated, let's update it slightly. Okay. In the year 2009, Sports Illustrated rated the greatest golfers of all Who did time. the first one, Golf Digest? Golf Digest okay. did the all first one. Right. In 2009, Sports Illustrated rated the greatest golfers of all time. Jack Nicklaus was number one. Tiger Woods zoomed up to number two. Ben Hogan was three. Sam Snead was four. Bobby Jones was five. Arnold Palmer was six. And Byron Nelson was seventh. So a guy who walked away in his prime, didn't have the lengthy career and add to his totals, was still in the top ten of all time. That's how good he was. But, of course, this is long before the television era. Mm -hmm. So, you know, golf was a little more insular. The general public didn't know as much about them. So the Hogan Sneeds, Nelsons of the world, probably didn't get the fanfare, the hoopla. Got none of that until, of course, the television era and Arnold Palmer came right. along. And that right. sort of set everything in motion. So you have to be a bit of a golf historian and kind of do a little research. But... That's how good Byron Nelson was. And again, the man he was and the character was even more memorable, I think, even than his pl great playing career. And in that short career, if he retired at 34, he probably had, what, about a 15-year career? He might have been out there 19 or 20, I don't know, mainly about 12. About 12. 12 years. Yeah. yeah. He had 54 overall. Yeah, exactly. Now – one of the most underrated players, I don't, this is probably a bad digression, but uh, Billy Casper never gets 
his due. 51 he won. 51 tour events. Well, so he, he's up in that top 10 pantheon for sure. Yeah, he should be. Yeah. Uh, he and uh, Phil Mickelson, or a few of them, sure. are vying yeah. for yeah. that. But, of yeah. course, you know, Billy Casper, just a fabulous uh, putter. Mm-hmm. The best putter of his era. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, the guy who managed his game well and had one shot, you know, drew every ball. The draw, yeah. You know, and so he'd aim accordingly. And by the time he was out on the senior tour, he was aiming over way over here at 3 o'clock and just whipping everything back in. Don January said he never choked. He, he said – Don admitted he choked some occasionally, but he said that uh, – uh, to, well, he he felt like Casper never choked. He might beat him, but he you know he didn't give it to you. So. I remember the uh, at Colonial, Tom Weisskopf was playing with Billy Casper when Weisskopf was a rookie, and he he missed a putt on nine and and read the break wrong, and it went, the break yeah. went opposite of his putt, which his next putt was longer than the one he had. Before he hit it again, Casper sort of waved him over and <laughs> said, "Let's talk after the round." And, <laughs> I think Casper gave him a little help after that. It was a shocking putt to see. But occasionally, you know, you see a pro top a ball, or I saw Fred Hawkins knock one in, you know, skull one in the water at 16 at Colonial one year, and I thought, okay, I could do that. But uh, Yeah, I, I watched a, a really good uh, lady golfer. Um, I think it was, oh, gosh, I, I should know her name. She won the, the, the Women's U.S. Open when they had it December at Champions. Oh. And uh, she cold shanked one on the last toe of the tournament. Still made par. Oh, okay. Uh, it was yeah. a par five. She was able to recover and make par. But yeah, it's like shocking to see that. Um, just to kind of wrap up a little bit on Byron, I, I think it's just amazing. And one of the reasons I believe in God, uh, I, 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 that's maybe too much of an extrapolation, but Byron Nelson and Ben Hogan grow up together in a little city in Texas and caddy together and become two of the greatest golfers of all time. What are the odds of that? And just it's so charming, if you will. I I know they weren't maybe their closest of friends. They loved each other. They respected each other. They were different as night as day, but. Yeah, totally different upbringing. A uh, real tough, uh, really tough life for Ben Hogan as a young child. Not yes. so much for Byron. Yes. Both caddying at uh, Glen Garden, playing in the caddy championship, tying for the championship, deciding they're going to have a playoff. Hogan wins the first hole, the first playoff. He thinks he's won the tournament. They tell him, no, I'm sorry, it's a nine hole playoff. <laughs> Byron comes by, back and wins the caddy playoff by one stroke. Gets an honorary membership at the club as the junior champion. They disregard Ben pretty much altogether. He skulks away. Then they had different careers, as you know. And uh, Ben had needed a few years to work out he the kink. He didn't blossom till about thirty-four. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, he had a he had a little swing hitch. He mm-hmm. was a wild driver of the ball, especially early. Byron was, you know, a stroking machine. So, you know, but you're right. What are the odds those two kids were both caddying at Glen Garden Country Club in the south side of Fort Worth, Texas, all those years ago in the early, well, it's been 100 years since then. That would have been uh, about right now. Oh, yeah, Hogan was 10 years old. So it was 19, uh, 1922. And here we are, 101 years later. Talking about it. Talking about it. Well, those, and you know, it. Texas legends. Your yes. show is all about Texas legends yes. and golf, Pat, which is a great topic. My feeling is, in this modern world of podcasts, is that people in Scotland want to know about what they're talking about in Texas. Because Texas has such a tremendous reputation in golf, as well as in all of life, because it's a big state and has a wonderful, colorful history. And I'm not as well read as I would like to be, but I did read Texas by James Mishner. I'm so proud of myself. And I, would you concur that he is one of the great writers? Absolutely, sure, I would. I, I I could see every scene he was painting. You know, it was just amazing. And I we should also mention how much the Scottish golfers loved Ben Hogan when he went over there and uh, won at Carnoustie, and they called him the Wee Iceman. Yes, yes. So yes, yes. great reverence for Hogan. For winning the Open and the ticker tape parade back here in the United States when he came home. So, you know, the roar of the crowd, nothing like it. What what have we forgotten to talk about today? Only that Byron's record of 68.33 yes. strokes Stroke average. was the best ever in the history of the tour until the year 2000 when some upstart from California 
knock that record Eldrick? down. The Eldred Tiger Woods knock that down to sixty eight point one seven for the entire year. Holy cow! So you know, people ask about. I hear, in my opinion, I don't know what yours is, Pat. I'd like to hear it. My opinion is the best golf ever was played by Eldrick Tiger Woods in the year two thousand. That doesn't make him the greatest golfer ever. It makes him the greatest golfer ever at his peak. And I'll draw that distinction. I think Jack Nicholas is the greatest golfer ever, but I think Tiger at his peak is the greatest one season. Let's put it that way. Well, I would I would agree with that. I, I, I think that that over a career, Jack Nicholas is the greatest and definitely has the greatest record. Um I would say that if you and and, and I heard Hal Sutton say this. Here's the way Hal Sutton put it. Every golfer knows his weaknesses, and they play around them. And Jack was not a great chipper of the ball, but as he said, I didn't have to be. He had so many greens. He said Tiger Woods, when he was at his prime, never feared the next shot. In other words, he didn't play around anything. So at their best, I think Tiger was is the greatest golfer that's ever played. Jack has the better record. Um. I think Sam Snead is very much up in that. He may be the greatest natural golfer ever. And um and Snead had a tremendous record. He just never won a US Open and he had a few little hiccups there. Um Hogan, the ball striker, right? The, ball, the yeah. great ball striker. Um N- Nelson as my dad would say, whiskey hot. He won 11 in a row. <laughs> whiskey hot. Yeah. That's um, a great expression. Yeah. Um, you know. Now tell me about the Hal Sutton Pro-Am in Tyler. Seems like he used to host a tournament. Am I mistaken? At, uh, no, he didn't. He, they used to have an Eisenhower tournament maybe there that's for the it. University of Texas at Tyler, and he played in it often, as did a lot of the, the pros. Greg Norman played it in one year and that kind of thing. But uh, Which course was that? Was that at your course? That was at Holly Tree for at first, then it moved over to Willowbrook. Holly Tree is an old Devlin Von Hagee course. Oh, by that, I mean it's about 40 years old now, 38 years old now, and uh, it's on the – South side of Tyler, which is the area that's grown the most. Willowbrook is on the north side, the older part of Tyler, and it's kind of on the way to Dallas, uh, which makes it easier for me, uh, you know, as a non-resident member to get there from Dallas. But, um, oh, gosh, Byron Nelson played an exhibition round at Willowbrook. Ben Hogan played an exhibition round at, at Willowbrook. I love the sports writing of that era in the, in the early 50s. The sports writer in Tyler said he looked at every green as if he were buying a house, <laughs> which means That's he's a- looking at everything. Um, Walter Hagen played a practice round. I mean, played a practice round, played an exhibition round with uh, Joe Kirkland, the great trick shot artist. Oh, right. Yeah, sure. From uh, Australia. So we can go on and on. Russ, you are a delight, my man. Uh, it's great being with you. Pat. Yes. Um, I just think it's great that the Byron Nelson is still going strong. They're still raising money. Peggy Nelson's still going strong. Oh, I almost forgot my my favorite Byron Nelson story. Oh, what's that? So I will have to re- recount this, and then I want you to have the final word. But uh, uh, Mr. Triggs, bless his heart, A.J. Triggs, went into the Golf Hall of Fame in 2013. He played at North Texas. He was a great amateur. But he was president of the Texas Golf Association on two separate occasions, and he just promoted golf, and he was in the Texas Golf Hall of Fame. But in 1960, in Mineola, during the Watermelon Festival, there was an exhibition round out at Mineola Country Club, a great little nine-hole course. Benny Castellew was the great amateur from Mineola, played for North Texas, won the Armed Services Amateur, and A.J. Triggs, were against Byron Nelson and Palmer Lawrence, a great golf name who was a pro at Pinecrest Country Club in Longview at the time. So as A.J. said, if you were going to rob a bank, that would have been the day because the whole town (laughs) was out there at the golf course, and Byron was doing a clinic. And I told Peggy this story. I hope she enjoyed it as much as I did telling her it. And he was hooking one and fading one and this and that. And so they get to the first tee. And everybody hits, and then it's Byron's turn. And they had giant watermelons for tea markers. And A.J. said you could see his mind click. And he took his tea, 
and he stuck it in top of one of those watermelons. <laughs> And he hit it baseball style right down the middle, 250 yards. As as I said, a boatload of talent. A boatload of talent. That's a great story. I love it. Well, let me uh, say one thing. And you were mentioning your faith. And um, certainly Byron Nelson was a man of deep faith and had a close association with his church. And, of course, also did a lot, raised a lot of money, endowed funds with Abilene Christian yes. University. Had a real yes. close uh, there and um, was a man of deep faith and if uh, those of you conversant in the bible look up uh, galatians paul's letter to the galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 you will see what's known as the fruits of the spirit mm. and anyone if anyone on earth all of us fallible souls embody the fruits of the spirit it's byron nelson I will say that, and I'd like to end with this other quick story. Since you and I have had exchanges on Facebook mm -hmm. quite often, and uh, I followed your show in various forms on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, there's a popular poll going on around in Facebook that asks people, who's the most famous person you've ever met? Now, Pat, I'd be curious to know who the most famous person you've ever met. Well, it, I guess it would have to be Donald Trump because he's so well known uh, and so. Was famous. that in Turnberry? Uh, Turnberry in Scotland. Um, I, I may be forgetting someone, and Lord forgive me. Uh, of course, I met Byron Nelson, and uh, I met Ben Hogan. There you go. Um, I took lessons from a guy named George Alexander, who was a great teacher, and his son. Uh, Washi is about my age, and um, I had gone over to Shady Oaks to see a friend of mine try to qualify for the U.S. Mid-Amateur, and I went into the locker room, and Hogan walked right up. He had been out hitting balls. He was sweaty, and I said, uh, Mr. Hogan, I hope you're doing well after your surgery. He says, well, I am. How did you know? And I said, well, I've been taking lessons from George Alexander. Oh, great. And he said, please tell George I said hello. And very gracious. Uh, and I'll have to say Donald Trump was very gracious. I know he is a polarizing figure, but, you know, he kidded us. You guys under par today? Of course we weren't. Um, my friend Sepp Harden, he swirled back around. I didn't hear this. He said, uh, um, how'd you do? And Sepp said, well, I bogeyed the last hole. And he goes, so did Watson. Of course, referring to the – which – if Tom Watson had won that British Open at age 59, it would have been the greatest sports story of our lifetime, not just golf story. Exactly. Stop the presses. That would have that been it. Close. That close. That uh, close. And I hope – I've got – in my heart, I want to get Tom on this show, but – well, he's out, you've he, been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much. It's been great here. And I uh, understand, Pat, that Tom's out cutting horses just west of Fort Worth on some property he now owns in Weatherford. So I hope you're good luck getting him on the show. He'd be a big hit. Sure. Well, he knows Roy Pace over in Longview pretty well. And Roy gave him a couple of my books. And he liked the beer and barbecue one. I don't know if he liked the Fringe Runner, but he said he liked the beer and barbecue one, which was about all the old Calcutta tournaments back when I was a little kid. Um, but anyway, Russ Pate, thank you so much. Now, is there anything you want to plug as far as a book? I know you wrote a book. I don't know if we're going over time here and don't really want to go off in it too much, but you wrote a wonderful book about the homeless problem, which I think I want to read about. I'll get you a copy of that. Yeah. Okay. Heaven Sent. Okay. About a ministry here in Dallas. So, okay. yeah, that was, a, that was a great project. And the only other thing I'll say, and you can cut this out, of course, is that on the Facebook question – I don't know if I would tell you the most famous person I ever met was either Harry Truman, Joe DiMaggio, or Lucky Luciano. I can't decide who's the most famous, and one might be the most notorious, but I do know the nicest person I've ever met, and that is Byron Nelson. That's wonderful. So, That's wonderful. And, 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 and this won't get cut out, I hope, but if you ask the Lord Jesus into your heart, then he's going to be the greatest person Amen. you've ever met. Amen. And uh, and you can't go wrong with that. And with that, I want to thank you one more time. And, folks, next week we're going to have Scott Verplank on, and we look forward to chatting with you then on Hit It Where They Mow, Talking Golf in Texas. 
Thank you.